Hi everyone and welcome to Open Court World Hour CanCan. -Can. My name is Leila Bumbra and I'm the Programme Manager for the Research Forum here at the Courtauld. And I want to start by saying, as always, the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially all things Open Courtauld. Tonight, we are welcoming you to imagine you're in the Moulin Rouge. We invited you to enter a world of splendor, misery and excess. In this hour, the electrifying entertainment of the CanCan -Can and Cabaret of the Courtauld Collection takes centre stage. Like the Can Can, a spectacular feat, this hour takes inspiration from the nighttime entertainment in Belle Epoque, Paris. These spaces allowed bohemians and aristocrats, men and women, to rub elbows, revel in exuberant shows, and proliferated revolutionary thought. Bringing together experts, creatives, and figures from across the court world community and outside it, this hour will capture the excitement and spectacle of Bohemian Paris in the 1890s. Before we kick off, I want us to do a little bit of housekeeping. We will have a few short talks and in conversation and about 10 minutes at the end for your questions, which myself and Rachel, our curator of Works on Paper, will be able to answer. You can get these to me throughout the hour via the chat and also on social media. We are on at Courtauld Res and please do use the hashtag Open Courtauld Hour to let us know what you think. Okay, so in a slightly different setup than usual today, I will actually be the one who is introducing some of our collection and its relationship uh, to and representations of the Paris entertain entertainment industry and also the characters who inhabit it. Okay, so many of you at home may have been to or heard about the exhibition at the Courtauld, Toulouse Lautrec and Jane Avril Beyond the Moulin Rouge, which ran June to September, 2011. So this exhibition brought together all the different types of representations of Avril by Lautrec. And these representations displayed and promoted this fascinating dancer in a multitude of ways. In particular, it drew on a variety of mediums in which the artist and performer capitalized on to promote the artist, the performance, and actually the venue, the Moulin Rouge itself. For example, we had paintings, photos, and posters in this exhibition. So I wanted to show you these three formats to actually introduce you all in more detail to our collection and a painting in particular that platforms the CanCan -Can implicitly and also explicitly. So this Open Quartal Hour really started because I was inspired to revisit works by Lautrec that are now back on the walls of our gallery. And it also seemed timely to me to have this dedicated episode to all things Lautrec as yesterday marked the Trek's birthday. And here in London, Moulin Rouge the musical opened a week or so ago. So there are a lot of things Trek that are in the atmosphere at the moment. And in the next 10 minutes, I wanted to take you on a really whistle-stop tour of this relationship between Avril and Trek, the artist and performer as separate creatives, as well as collaborators in this nighttime entertainment machine. As well, I wanted to touch on the venue itself, the Moulin Rouge and the dance as evoked in our collection and outside it. So if we go on to the first slide, great, thank you. So the characters of the Moulin Rouge, particularly Trek and Avril, were extraordinary and idiosyncratic. And I'm sure many of you will have seen them brought to life through the Baz Luhrmann film Moulin Rouge that was released back in 2001. And this starred Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman. And Nicole Kidman's character is actually meant to be based on Jane Avril herself. And interestingly, the real life characters were just as fascinating as those that have been evoked in this film. Critics at the time of Lautrec and Avril were so quick to note the ways in which artists and performers like them created art that was truly representational of that moment in history. And this is why tonight's event is so important to transport us back to that time and really get a sense of who these people were and what motivated them to produce what they did. So this is both the dance and the art that conveyed it. So the artist probably doesn't need much of an introduction. He was one of the most famous avant-garde artists of his time and is famed in particular for his posters like the one on the screen just now, which were designed to attract clientele to the Moulin Rouge and other venues of nighttime entertainment in Paris in the 1890s. And you actually can't walk around a corner in Paris without seeing a stall selling reproductions of these posters on some object or another. 
And for me, this somewhat distracts from the actual pioneering lithographic printing processes and designs that Lautrec developed. It's complicated and convoluted in many ways to achieve this dexterity and layering of color that we can see just now using these techniques, which we kind, uh, we kind of forget in 2021 when we were also so able to digitally enhance and produce marketing materials at almost a drop of a hat. And similarly to the processes, the names of the performers who grace the stage of the Moulin Rouge, the stars of these artworks are less known to us today, even though the posters quite often state their nicknames or their actual names in some cases. Okay, on to the next slide, please. Um, Avril has in many ways, as you can see her here next to Lautrec, become one of the most emblematic figures in Lautrec's world of dancers, cabaret singers, musicians, and prostitutes. And that's kind of summarized in the fact that she is in Moulin Rouge, the musical as well. And she was one of the stars made famous by her presence at the Moulin Rouge during this decade. Here, she was a dancer who was well known for delighting audiences with her strange and flamboyant performances. Avril was given to jerky movements and sudden contortions while doing her high kicks. And what is so interesting about Avril is that she had a very particular history, which set her apart from many other performers at the Moulin Rouge at that time. She had actually been a patient at a mental hospital and rather than hiding this fact, she used her unique set of circumstances to inform and feed into the ways in which she acted out her performance on stage. So if we go to the next slide, um, yes, so this is particularly prevalent in the almost caricature-like depictions that Lutrec did of Jane Avril in the posters at the time. You can see what I'm talking about here. Her leg is in the semi-high kick, but with the knee at a slightly off angle. And it's this strange contortion in the artwork that really displays this jerky dance that she was really well known for at the time. And it also helps with her leg, the way it looks mid kick or movement. And that helps us to envision the actual performance itself. Essentially, you can almost feel movement in a static image and it entices us, the viewer, to see the performance in the flesh. In a second as well, her leg may be extended and her upper thigh and underwear may be exposed. So the image has the same titillation the can can promises. In many ways, then, the allure is always indicated in these works. And yeah, that's quite key here in this, um, definitely. So Lautrec and Avril actually had polar opposite backgrounds in many ways. They were world apart in terms of privilege and how they'd grown up. Avril was working class, whereas Lautrec's family were wealthy and had a lineage that extended back to the time of Charlemagne. This meant he grew up in a typically aristocratic manner. But saying that, by the time these works that are on the screen right now, and also the ones in our collection were produced, they both inhabited the world of the bohemian elite in Montmartre and were privy to the notoriety that came with it. This hillside district on the fringes of northern Paris was associated with the Parisian underworld and the romanticized bohemian lifestyles of artists and performers. And it was known to attract those eager for a frisson of alcohol and sex, essentially. It offered an authorized and temporary experience of the darker side of modern metropolitan life at that time in Paris. And the magazine La Vie Parisienne described the women of Montmartre as cunning, possessing loose morals and attractive in a regular way, which is um, quite rude when you think about it. But when we look to these sources, uh, we can really pinpoint the seductive nature of this area and the women within it. And it's evident that by being associated with this area, women like Avril could oscillate between a position of desirability and also be a threat. So the physical terrain where they were working was inherently complex. So Avril courted the idea herself in her well-known nickname, The Explosion, associating herself directly with danger and kind of mocking this idea that the women in Montmartre were dangerous and threatening. So in the next slide as well, we can see how she evokes a femme fatale, the 
uh, inclusion of the snake is associated with danger and alludes in some ways to Medusa from Greek mythology, who's famed for having venomous snakes in place of hair. So Avril and Lautrec's lasting association with this area through their joint effort to be part of posters and paintings um, and what they sell locates them at the core of this really interesting network of ideas. Jane Avril is usually seen in this large hat as tall and thin and in these contortions and her success largely determined by her and by her employers cultivation of this easily identifiable image and a larger than life public persona. And, and indeed what we can take from this poster is that they actually both capitalized on the fact that they were anti-establishment figures in society at that time. So the Trek and Avril, apart from living lives outside of the normative um, what was acceptable at that time, actively promoted themselves as linked to danger and difference. They were visually outside the confines of normative looks too. So you saw in the photos of them earlier on, Lautrec was short of stature. He actually had a genetic deformity, which meant that he didn't grow, his legs were quite short. And Avril had this nervous twitch, which they think was linked to her time in the mental hospital. And yeah, you also saw how they both dressed. It was quite eccentric. They were known to wear bright colours, over-the-top hats, um, took part in cross-dressing and fancy dress, to name quite a few of their quirks. Okay, so in the next slide, we can see where they both met, which is the Moulin Rouge, um, a haunt of the artist after it opened in 1889. And its founders, Charles Zidler and Joseph Oller, opened this new dance hall with its improved facilities, novelty, and implied sexual commerce. And you can see the novelty quite clearly here in this picture with the giant elephant they had in the back. And it attracted a smart clientele, making those like Avril with sensationalized performances headline acts. And I wanted to contextualize this fame really quickly with her contemporary Lagalou, who was another headline act. She earned 3,750 francs a week which is an extraordinary amount considering the typical working class women earned an average of about three francs a day. And the average earnings of a can-can dancer was only 70 francs a day. So it's obvious then that the Moulin Rouge allowed some to access the public sphere, which was traditionally um, the domain of the men in the West. And it's even more amazing that these women are immortalized by the trek in a manner that shows their individuality, the performative spark and their grasp of self-promotion. So what's good to note now is the fact that there were numerous mediums in which to assert and disseminate subversive actions beyond the confines of Montmartre's nightlife, infiltrating not only the streets of Paris through the advent of posters, but also the buildings on them. The large, bold posters enabled passers-by, educated and illiterate to apprehend them while walking and to make split second impressions on the performance they promoted. So they really permeated geographical realities and encroached upon everyday experience because they're ubiquitous and unavoidable on the walls throughout the city to all classes and genders. So yeah, there's really a lot to take out of that in terms of what this industry allowed women to have, but also it's key to note that it's a notoriously short-lived position where one star could be easily replaced by another. Okay, so on the next slide, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the dance itself. So Lagalou the Glutton, who I mentioned before, was famed for drawing mixed audiences with a fast-paced rendition of the Can-Can, and sources convey how her rejuvenated Can-Can was um, extremely erotic, um, provocative body language, overexcited yelps and high kicks that often expose bare flesh to the point of indecency, was utilised by Lagalou and then the dancers that came after her to scale the ranks of the venue, for example, the Moulin Rouge. And it's really key in works like this where you can see her high kick. And this resurgence of the dance has been linked to the 1850s when rural workers flocked to Paris. And this will be touched on later on by Richard, who's going to talk in more detail about La Chahou. Um, and I wanted to just show you all this work to flag how many dance forms were appropriated and adapted to fit the needs of the performer at this time. So this work is called The Mirror Chance, indicating that Lagalou would be enacting a form of belly dance. 
However, as you can see, she's doing a can-can style dance represented in this high kick. Um, but the stereotypical oriental figures and the Islamic moon included in this artwork kind of show that she's play acting and she's using this dance form in her own terms and um, to expand and appeal to new audiences. As well, I want to show you this image because you can see Jane Avril in the center with her hat, very large there, and also a very short statured to lose the trek. So they're really working on the caricature here. And you'll be able to spot other Mamatra celebrities if you look closer later on. Um, so in the next image, um, yeah, so these images I've shown you already, and this one really show that the Moulin Rouge itself was the place to be, partly through its reliance on the dances, artists and performers associated it, with it, but also um, it's a place where artists like Lautrec and Avril became friends through their joint investment in the performance venue, and also the fact that they could use each other to kind of alleviate and help each other gain fame. So Lautrec painted a series of striking portraits of Avril which show this reverie he felt towards the performer. And this particular one is housed in our collection. So as we can see from this work, he doesn't simply show her dancing or on stage like the posters I showed before, but he shows an intimate moment, a moment where she is quiet and she's in private contemplation. She's made to be an individual as both connected to and separate from her on stage persona. She is recognizably the same person who is represented in the posters, but away from the bright lights, the glitz and glamour of the Moulin Rouge stage, this work executed in oil and pastels evokes a more real and complex woman than the one seen in the advertising images. And the carriage wheel and light in the background of this work does hint that she's entering the building, possibly for a performance. But for me, what is really striking in this image is Jane's gaunt face, which, yeah, it's just really, really beautiful. And you can see that it tells a story of someone that's really different from extroverted, sensual women that she owed her fame to. There's, in some ways, nowhere else that shows the sad, strange, and perhaps seedy 1890s of Romatra more sharply than this beautiful portrait that we have in our collection. And there has been a lot of scholarship about this work, and a lot of it does focus on the presence of a hat and coat in the background, but that's quite that is still not being decided what that means. So to end on the last slide, the truth of this work and the people it evokes is far stranger than the fiction it inspires in films like Moulin Rouge. Avril is bleakly displayed in this work. The dangerous reality of Montmartre in the 1890s jars with the memory of it as nostalgic, cosy, soft and glamorous. And there's really no sanitizing the underbelly of society here. Lautrec depicts Avril in a modernist manner. He's teetering towards abstraction and he somehow records a brutal reality of this figure and the life that she lived in acid tone colors. So there was obviously a lot more at play here than high kicks. So that is all for me. I am now absolutely delighted to introduce you all to my wonderful colleague, Rachel Sloan, who is assistant curator of Works on Paper here at the Courtauld. Rachel is going to talk about our works on paper and maybe a few more images of the nighttime industry of Paris and the dance it's so famous for. These are truly stunning works, so I'm really thankful that Rachel has come on this evening to show them off in all their glory. Rachel, I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Layla. Um, now, if you just bear with me, I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Um, so it's my, my great privilege to be able to introduce um, the, uh, the Courtauld's collection of works on paper by Toulouse-Lautrec. And although we're really fortunate to have two absolutely splendid paintings by him, one of which um, you've just seen, um, the Courtauld's holdings of uh, his drawings and prints um, are even richer. Um, we have four drawings and 21 prints. And this marvelous collection is largely thanks to Samuel Courtauld himself. Um, although we don't often hear about um, Courtauld's love of Toulouse Lautrec the way we do about um, his enthusiasm for, for artists like Cezanne or Manet or Renoir or Gauguin, the numbers, I think, really tell another story. So with 
only a few exceptions, the prints and drawings focus on the subject matter for which Toulouse Lautrec is best known. That is the glittering world of Parisian popular entertainment, as well as its seamier underside. They range from a bravura scene of jockeys racing their horses to victory at the fabled Longchamp race course um, on the left, to lively images of entertainers like the English dancer Ida Heath and the French singer Yvette Guder plying their trade, as well as the women who worked in the brothels of Montmartre, um, whom he portrayed with uncommon humanity and empathy. Now, figures like Guibert with her cartoonish face, which I have to say, Lautrec, to lose Lautrec only slightly exaggerated, her, her pile of blonde hair and her long black gloves, and of course, Jane Avril, these are all people we still readily associate with Belle Epoque Paris. But in uh, my time tonight, I would like to, um, to focus on another performer whose name is much less well known today, who made a brief but blazing impression on Toulouse-Lautrec and his work. And this is the actress, dancer, and singer Marcel Lender. Lender appears in no less than three prints in the collection. In the earliest, on the left, which dates from 1893, she appears alongside uh, another actor, a comedian uh, named Louis Bouchenet, who is known as Baron. Um, they're probably depicted in a performance at the Théâtre des Variétés in Paris, where she made a name for herself. Fast forward two years, and Marcel Lender begins popping up everywhere in Toulouse-Lautrec's work, nearly always wearing the same larger-than-life costume, uh, which we see in the two other prints. A dress with voluminous puffed sleeves and a towering Medici collar, uh, accessorized with a huge choker necklace and two enormous pink silk flowers erupting like flames or plumes from her hair. But just who was Marcel Lender? She's hardly a household name today. Well, first of all, that wasn't her real name. Uh, like many of the performers whom Toulouse Lautrec depicted, um, she worked under a stage name. She was born Amarie Marcel Bastien in 1862. And she began performing at the age of 16 um, in Paris and soon made a name for herself and became a real star at the Théâtre des Variétés, which actually still stands today um, on the Boulevard Montmartre in Paris. And her most famous role was in uh, the operetta Chute Paris, uh, in which toulouse lautrec saw her perform in the spring of 1895. Uh, now, photographs taken of her at the height of her career, um, such as this one, depict a glamorous and sophisticated woman who is much more conventionally attractive than the likes of Jane Avril or Yvette Gilbert. And it's also important to emphasize that unlike Jane Avril, who was a close personal friend of the artist, Marcel Lender was more of a, a passing crush um, or a, a furia, um, as toulouse Track dubbed the brief and intense infatuations he often developed with particular female performers. He first encountered this flamboyant redhead in 1893, as I, um, as I mentioned in the, um, the print um, session in the previous slide, the year he began to <clears throat> attend the theater on a regular basis. But his infatuation with her reached its peak two years later when she, started, when she starred in this um, revival of the, um, the operetta Chute Perique, which was um, by a French um, librettist and composer named Hervé. Um, so it was performed at the Théâtre des Variétés um, from February 1st to May 1st, 1895. Um, and this is a, a comic operetta uh, recounted the tale of Chilperic, uh, King of the Franks in the late 16th century, which I must admit to us today sounds like a rather um, unusual or un indeed unlikely subject for a, for a musical comedy. Anyway, just to give a, a capsule version of the, the plot, uh, in a bid to consolidate his power, uh, Chilperic um, allies himself with the Visigoths um, who rule Spain through marriage to their, their princess Gal, um, Galswinth, um, even though even while his vengeful mistress Fredegonde uh, plots her murder. So, um, so much for the plot. Um, and, and indeed, Toulouse Trek wasn't uh, particularly um, uh, interested in the melodramatic plot or in the extravagant staging. Um, his, his eyes were entirely for Lender. Uh, in the role of the princess. And during the operetta's three-month run, he attended it more than 20 times, and he 
uh, almost invariably arrived just to see Lender dance the bolero in the second act, um, as depicted here. And when asked about his devotion to the play, he even uh, went so far as to explain, I come strictly in order to see Lender's back. Look carefully, you will seldom see anything as wonderful. Lender's back is sumptuous. He sketched and studied the actress diligently, um, ultimately producing six lithographs inspired by her appearance in Chilperic, um, five of them of the performance itself, and two paintings, including this uh, monumental canvas, which is now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And it's important to note that Lender wasn't a willing model and she didn't go to his studio to pose for him. These are all works that are based on studies that are taken on the fly. And in fact, she, she really disliked the artist and remarked of him, what a horrible man. He's very fond of me, but as for the portrait, you can have it. Now, if we just um, take a look again at, um, at how she really looked, it's somewhat easy to understand her dislike when you compare her actual appearance to Toulouse Trek's somewhat caricatural portrayal of her in this painting and in the prints. Marcel Lender dancing the bolero in Chilperic de depicts the very scene the artist so enjoyed, uh, in which um, the Princess Gala Swinth performs the bolero, uh, a lively, lively dance from, from her native Spain, which I, uh, I would hazard to guess didn't exist in the sixth century, um, for her future husband and his courtiers. Um, so she, um, she completely dominates the, the um, center of the composition. Um, she's dressed in a very loosely um, Spanish-inspired um, costume. Um, her body is described in strong and sinuous lines, um, and Toulouse Trek has captured her in mid-movement, um, with one um, long uh, black stocking leg emerging from a swirl of pink silk petticoats, um, which echo the outrageous um, huge silk floral decoration in, in her hair. And um, it's, it's, uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can very much see that, it, um, that, she, that this is a theatrical scene, she's on stage because her, 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 her exposed skin is tinged green by the footlights. And all the eyes of the court are on her as, as she dances. We have the King Chilperic uh, on his throne at the left and her brother, uh, Don Nervoso, um, standing on the far right, um, gazing at her um, from behind with an expression of, uh, I will say, um, uh, rather unbrotherly appreciation. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's been kind of suggested that he's a stand-in for, um, for Toulouse-Lautrec, um, admiring uh, Marcel Lender's splendid back. However, uh, Lender's dislike of Toulouse-Lautrec and his portrayal of her seems, I have to say, just a tiny bit unfair when we consider this print, uh, which is his most complex and sophisticated printed portrait of her. This print is a real tour de force of the lithographer's art. Uh, he's represented her yet again in um, her costume from Chilperic, but this time only bust length. Um, the better to focus on the details of her costume, uh, her, um, her bold and brazen expression, and her flaming red hair. And in this lithograph, he used no less than eight different colors. And this might not seem worth remarking on today, but the, th the fact is when you make a, lith a color lithograph, you require a different stone for each different color. And all of these different stones had to be properly lined up so that the colors didn't, weren't misregistered. And as if to up the stakes, Toulouse Trek layered the colors with tremendous verve and sophistication. He placed a, a, um, a net of navy blue over green um, to show the, the pattern of the material on her bodice. Uh, he laid stripes of red and blue over the, the pink of her um, hair ornaments to evoke their sparkle under the stage lights. And most impressive of all, he, he sprayed a fine mist of red over the orange of her hair to amplify its brilliance. Lender may not look as conventionally attractive as she does in her glamorous stage photographs, but as a portrait of a performer at work, this print succeeds brilliantly. It fizzes with the vitality that endeared her to Parisian audiences at the height of her career. And I think it's also fair to say that Toulouse-Lautrec ensured her immortality long after her fame as a performer waned. Thank you so much, Rachel. I love that she was basically raging and unimpressed um, by the way she was depicted. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Richard Thompson. Richard Thompson is a research professor in the history of art at the University of Edinburgh. 
He's a familiar face at the court old as he gained both his MA and PhD from here. His publications in the field of late 19th century French art are extensive and he's co-curated and curated many exhibitions for major international museums, which have been seen by some 5 million people. And this makes Richard the perfect person to be with us this evening. So I'll pass it over for, to Richard. Good evening. I'm going to talk to you about Seurat's great painting, Show. It is the fifth of the six major canvases that he painted before his early death in 1891. Show is a large life-size picture with the figures Grande Nature. Seurat worked on it over the winter of 1889 to 90, and it was exhibited at the Salon des Indépendants in Paris in the spring of 1890. His previous major painting had been Parade de Cirque, a scene outside a traveling circus. There, he had applied his neo-impressionist technique, the active use of complementary colors, the pointiest touch, to an outdoor nighttime scene. By contrast, Chou is indoors and under artificial light. Seurat also applied his friend Charles Henri's theories about the direction of lines. Lines on a diagonal rising above the horizontal, as with the legs of the dancers, the musical instruments, the conductor's baton, and the walking stick of the man at the bottom right. These, for Henri, were dynamogenic, positive, and joyful. But the overall design of show, like the dancer's smiles, seems very forced. So how do we read that, that gaiety, that energy? Show means ruckus or racket. It was applied in the 1880s to a particularly eroticized variant of the can-can, a dance that had become fashionable in the 1850s and 60s, and by the 1880s was commonly staged in popular cafe concerts and uh, music halls. Seurat's friend Jean Agilbert, a lawyer and a man of the left, had written a poem in 1886 on show, and the lines Illuminant l'obscenité de son sourire et de sa jambe suggest that there could be a critical attitude to such a performance. So should we see the way Seurat rhymed the dancers' smiles and the folds of their skirts, for example, as in some way critical? The idea for the composition began with a drawing named after the divan japonais, a small Montmartre Café Concert. It was made in 1888, 1887-8, exhibited in 1888, and includes only a single dancer. The composition was developed via a small oil sketch, now in the Courtauld collection, um, in which Seurat added a second dancer and also began to clarify the spectator at lower right and added the hands of the flautist to lower left. The larger oil study, now in Buffalo, established four dancers for the picture, which you get in the final show painting, now in Otterlo. From the outset, it was obvious that while Seurat paid homage to a type of composition used by naturalist artists such as Degas, placing the spectator in the audience, looking over the orchestra to the stage behind, he wasn't seeking descriptive accuracy. This was deliberately stylized with the uniformity of shapes such as the dancer's legs or the gas lamps, as well as the exaggeration of facial features such as eyes, smiles and moustaches. There's a powerfully caricatural element apparent in show. Now, what stylistic and social associations were at play? In the 1880s, the colour poster was a new and very visible aspect of popular culture. And Robert Herbert, many years ago, made this conjunction between Seurat's painting and uh, this design by the great poster designer, Jules Chéret. Under the Third Republic, the law of the 29th of July, 1881, liberalised press censorship. 
And as a result, illustrated periodicals flourished and caricature became a very active part of French visual culture. Seurat's work matured in this climate. So an image such as this one by Alfred Robida with repetitive stylized dancers anchored by a dark foreground figure is the sort of thing that might have stayed in his imagination. Here's a drawing by Steinlen for Le Merliton. And the dancer of the Cancan Chahu was a common image in this illustrated press. Marmite used by Steinlen here means a cooking pot, but it was also slang for a prostitute who earned her living for a pimp. Here, the figure's angelic wings are ironic and her halo is a 20 franc piece. She's kicking up her legs to reveal her underwear and she's dominating the city of Paris. A similar motif comes in Le Courrier Francais in 1889 in this drawing by Lunel, where again it's a chauteurs who welcomes provincials and foreigners to the Exposition Universelle of 1889. She's a more important figure identifying Paris than the newly constructed Eiffel Tower. We've seen how in show Sura gradually developed the male spectator at the lower right, who in the final painting looks up lecherously towards the front female chauteurs. The image of the dominated male was also common in contemporary caricature, such as this drawing by Willette, where Piero and another Commedia dell'arte figure, uh, representing artist and writer respectively, kneel enraptured before the costumed dancer. Men who were keen on what Ajalbert's poem had called l'obscenité de son sourire et de sa jambe were described in the contemporary press as pigs. Look at the cover designed by Georges Auriol for this book on vice in Paris by Pierre Delcourt from 1887, where the naked female figure stands on a pig. The male spectator in show has a retroussé nose, so it might be argued that Serra was making such an illusion. Caricature, both in style and imagery, seems to me to lurk embedded in show. A new point, however, might be made about style. Flat figures, caricatural faces, and above all, repetitive, simplified movements were typical of ancient Greek black figure vases. These were praised in Charles Blanc's 1867 Grammaire des Arts du Dessin, which Seurat had avidly read as a student. They interested Seurat's friend Charles Henri because of their linear structure. And in 1889, when Seurat was underway, Seurat's fellow neo-impressionist Paul Signac spent a lot of time measuring vases in the Louvre for Henri's researches including probably this one, uh, which was purchased by the museum in 1883. Seurat could be stimulated in his search for stylization by the art of the contemporary caricature and also of the ancient past. But to return to the present, in October 1889, the Moulin Rouge had opened in the Place Blanche, where Montmartre met, meets the city centre. Advertised by Cheret in this poster here, it was immediately popular and quickly became a key figure in Parisian nightlife. Gunert's painting showing fancy dress revelers leaving at dawn is typical of that. Part of the success of the Moulin Rouge was the show, another name for which was the quadrille naturaliste, bringing in the allusion to the naturalist novels of writers such as Émile Zola and Guy de Maupassant, which described every aspect of modern life, however gross or sordid. The Moulin Rouge was immediately taken up as a subject by painters. This artist, Edouard Gelhay, had a painting of it at the Salon in the spring of 1890. So did Toulouse-Lautrec at the Indépendant, this picture on the left, the rehearsal of the new girls. 
Both show the same wall of windows opening onto the garden. Both use the typical devices of naturalist painting. In Toulouse-Lautrec, the instant of the figures dancing, standing on one foot on the, in the Gelhe, the waiter tilting the table. Both of them have figures very close up to the spectator. Toulouse-Lautrec's rehearsal of the New Girls was shown at the Salon des Indépendants at the same time as Seurat's Chahou. Chahou was recognized by critics as being another step forward in neo-impressionist experiments with color and touch. Its caricatural quality was also acknowledged. Gustave Geoffroy writing in La Justice about the visible assertion of expressive and caricatural drawing. Fernand Javel in La Francais compared Chahou and Lautrec's rehearsal of the New Girls, preferring Lautrec's more lifelike representation to what he called the violent caricature of Sarah. So in the end, I think that we should acknowledge the caricatural aspect of the painting and how Chahou engaged with the culture of popular illustration. But that could be a complex and by no means certain of path for interpreting the picture. The caricatures I've shown might be taken of criticism of the male bourgeoisie lecherously admiring the lifted skirts of the chauteurs. But that imagery also reveled in the subject, so the critique might smack of hypocrisy. Perhaps Chahou is best understood not only as an exciting stylistic experiment, combining avant-garde neo-impressionist technique with a stylization traceable back to ancient Greek black figure paint vases, but also as an image which contributed to the slippery debates about sensation and sensuality in contemporary Parisian culture. Thank you very much for listening to me. Amazing, thank you so much again, Richard. I am now so excited to share an interview that we pre-recorded with Hannah Williams, dancer, choreographer, and lecturer. Hannah Williams is a Birmingham-based independent researcher and lecturer in the field of dance. She holds a master's degree in theatre performance research and a BA on English and cultural studies from the University of Warwick. Having worked for 15 years as a professional dancer with specialist styles, including Can Can and the Charleston, Hannah has worked across land and sea within TV, theatre and film. Professionally, Hannah directs Creator Fuse Dance Company, whose credits include commissions by Disney, Selfridges, Liberty of London, NHS, BBC, Channel 5, um, to name a few. So we will share this interview with you now. So thank you, Hannah, for joining and welcome to the virtual portal. Thank, thank you, you so again much. for agreeing to talk through your practice with me and to kick off, I wondered if either want to talk about yourself, so introduce yourself, and also explain a little bit about your experience of working in the world of Can Can. Yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, my name is Hannah Williams, and um, I'm a choreographer, um, an ex-professional dancer, and I now sort of really operate as an independent dance researcher. Um, I've got specialist interests in um, female body economy, um, but with my background as a commercial and corporate choreographer and dancer, um, specifically within the commercial arenas. Can Can is, um, it's a big seller. It's a crowd pleaser. Um, you'll see it at corporate events up and down the country. I've been lucky enough to perform it at, um, across the UK, abroad, um, and also at sea, which is quite difficult on a boat. <laughs> so um, I actually had my first experience with Can Can when I was 16. So um, I was part of a dance school that had um, an agency sort of come in to see if there was any young talent available um, and ended up learning and then performing a, a Can Can at the NEC in Birmingham and just thinking this is the best job in the world. Um, I didn't get paid a lot of money, but it's just such a vibrant and lively dance style and the way that the audience immediately recognises the music and the movement. Um, the costumes are outrageous. Um, it's all a little bit frivolous and a little bit naughty. And I think at 16 years old, that was kind of exactly what I was looking for um, after leaving my Irish Catholic education. <laughs> Um, so my experience from them really with Can Can has been 
um, looking at the history of CanCan, -Can, but then also performing it on a regular basis to a, a mixed array of audiences, as well as teaching workshops um, and events um, within mainstream education, higher education, um, and also just really enjoying the dance style and loving the Moulin Rouge, loving the history, loving the film, being obsessed with the film. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of a passion project really for me, the, the Can Can. Amazing, thank you so much. And I'm just thinking as well, I've actually got a picture of the Moulin Rouge behind me that's not even, I didn't even plan that. But yeah, I'm <laughs> quite similar to you, Hannah, in that when I was doing dance at school, one of the things that me and my cohort of friends decided to do in our end of year show was a can-can because there is just <laughs> something so appealing when you're 16, 17, you've been at school, you just want to do something that's a little bit naughty and you get to do what you want. So yeah, as I mentioned in my emails before, the Courtauld does have a number of works by Toulouse Lautrec and we previously had the exhibition Toulouse Lautrec and Jane Avril Beyond the Moulin Rouge. Now, Toulouse Trek is a character in the musical and film, which you've just mentioned, and I know that you are actually going to see the musical soon, same as me. And I wondered if you had actually had the chance to visit any of Trek's artworks and, and if these helped you to understand the history of the performance or maybe inform or improve your own technique. And because I think there is something really interesting about depicting the movement and then using that static image to inspire future movements. I wondered if you had anything to say about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't visited the Cotold exhibition, but um, I've certainly seen um, Toulouse de Trek's works in other exhibits. Um, and I think as a dancer of the Can Can, you're very familiar very early on with that imagery, even if it's being used in a, a very basic context on a leaflet, on a flyer. Um, if you go to a corporate event, it might be draped across the walls. Um, it's amazing how those images have stayed the course and are still so um, vibrant vibrant and iconic and I think with a lot of his imagery it is very static and I'm always interested in that he depicts the dancers on and off the stage so you have this juxtaposition between the dancer as the performer as the female that's being consumed by the audience and portraying herself in a certain performative way and then on the flip side of that she's sitting at the bar fully clothed um Edwardian dress covered and obviously with Can Can the movements are a titillation it's a kiss and trick economy so when we talk about kiss and trick it's we're showing an ankle we're showing a thigh it's very demure by our you know social standards now um but back then it really was something that just wasn't the done thing um and a lot of the movements such as the cathedral so this is where the girls put their their legs together to create like the pinnacle of the uh, cathedral of notre dame um or representative of the eiffel tower um, also like the piano man where the girls hitch their legs right up in the air um, so you're almost creating the splits in a, in a vertical form um, they're, they're reflective of a social economic time, a status um, they're elevating the women that perform those movements um, they're above the gentlemen, predominantly gentlemen audience, uh, a lot of the girls used to perform on racks around the top of the Moulin Rouge so they're actually physically looking up at the dancers and this is something you only see now really with with strippers um, and exotic dancing that the woman is sort of um, put on a pedestal physically and, and, and literally um, and, and looked up to. So I think with the Toulouse Lautrec work, it's it's really interesting that he's using these women in a similar way, but within the artwork, they're still very much a muse, they're encapsulated. They're almost frozen in time, um, especially with uh, Jane Avril. She, she's depicted so many times in so many different occasions with different facial expressions, different body positions. You start to build up a picture of who this woman really was without ever seeing her perform. Um, I've never seen any footage of her physically dance. I don't think any exists. I might be wrong. Um, but you do feel like you can build up this background to who she was and what she did through the depictions that, that Toulouse Lautrec has. Um, and I think as a can, can performer, the body positions and the, the actual character and frivolity and the energy that come through the artwork 
is second to none. You can see how those girls perform. You can hear their scream. So a can-can scream is always, yeah. It's very high pitched. It's like almost like a, a dog screaming on Prozac is the way I had a choreographer tell me once. But it's it, you can feel that through his art and, and his depictions of the can can floor and the skirts and the men in the background. Um, and I think it's it's absolutely central to an understanding of the Moulin Rouge at that time, the Fin de Sicale area in Paris, can uh, can dancing and just generally the the movement and the feeling that would have been around the Moulin Rouge as well in that time period. Yeah it's amazing you just mentioned Jane Avril because I think that's probably one of our most loved and emotive works that we have by Toulouse Trek and in the painting that we have you can almost see this close personal relationship between the artist and the performer. It's not just a case of him representing her as the muse you can see that he really appreciated her as an artist in her own right and I am actually a really big advocate of the idea that Jane Avril and Toulouse Trek challenge this um, muse idea as being one-sided and she used the power of her own celebrity promotional tools available to her that Trek created to advocate for herself which is really an interesting thing and she actually made quite a lot of money at the time and I was wondering if to be a can-can dancer, you actually researched, or you obviously have um, any of the other celebrities at the Moulin Rouge. Yeah, so I mean, Jane, Jane Avril is obviously the most famous from a Lautrec point of view, but um, one of my favourites is actually um, Le, Le Goulou, she was called, um, uh, Louise, <laughs> Louise Weber. Um, and she was really the, the, the kind of main infamous can-can dancer. She was the most flexible. She was kind of double jointed. Um, she was known for being very evocative and very vocal, um, having lots of liaisons with lots of inappropriate men. Um, she really kind of embodies the 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 can can really and um, so she was probably one of my favorites and one one of the girls that um or female dancers that I'd researched and looked into um I think she's different from Jane in the fact that Jane had this history of um she'd been in an asylum she actually learned dance within the asylum and it was her first taste of of dance performance and she she's known to have this nervous skittish energy when she performs um and I think her and Toulouse Lautrec shared a lot of um psycho analytic sort of um connections where they were from aristocracy but then they were sort of devoid of what the aristocracy would want but then they'd come and look at them and see them and view them um whereas really with uh, with louise she she worked her way up and she was a classical dancer from from a ballet background which a lot of the girls in the moulin rouge would have been um and we think of ballet as this beautiful classical dance style that's very genteel and very respectable and um, very highbrow. But these girls were, weren't working in a highbrow environment and the link between prostitution, ballet and can-can um, dance is, is all interconnected, it's all entwined. Um, so I find that really fascinating through that character that of Lagulu that she was... Um, able to personify herself and use her characteristics and her personality to really carve out a niche for herself and you know financially support herself these there wasn't a lot of options for women back back then um you know prostitution performance um psychic uh, work there was very few markets you could step into so I feel like she she's a real advocate for for sort of female empowerment um you know albeit in the Moulin Rouge with her skirt over her head with her ankles flashing and, and maybe a, a dashing prince from some other country waiting for her after the show <laughs> yeah she's she's one of my favorites as well because her name literally translates as the glutton and she was really renowned for eating doing what she wanted drinking excessively she was basically like a Ladette, I think we'd call yeah. contemporary times. Yeah, yeah she, she was fantastic. Um, there's been not that much research done, done on her. Um, no. Most of it has been done on Jane Avril, so I'm really glad that you mentioned her. And before we wrap up, I wanted to just ask you about the actual physicality of doing the can-can and all the moves associated with it, because the one time that I have done it, it has been extremely hard and I was terrible at it, but you need <laughs> to have really you need to be really strong and really flexible basically so I wondered if you wanted to touch on that quickly 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm 35 now and I first performed Can Can at 16 and the difference is palpable. Um, it's I think it's really about cardio and um, your core. You, you, if you've got strong abs, you can get those legs where they need to be. But we're looking at, you know, Orpheus in the Underworld, which is the famous piece of music for the Can Can, is between six and eight minutes long. There is a 12 minute version. And actually for a full out cardio performance where you're jumping and screaming and shouting, the legs are above the head, the hands are always supposed to be at chest height because you're holding the skirt. The skirts back at the Moulin Rouge would have been so heavy, so weighty fabric for days and um, the costumes I would have performed in they're made for dancers now so if you go to the Moulin Rouge in Paris now the costumes are still beautiful and you know in massive and engaging but they're much lighter they're much more flexible they're made for dance whereas these girls weren't wearing anything that was made for dance it was you know got the garter suspenders corsets breathing and doing the can-can in a boned whale boned corset beggar's belief and there, there is imagery and stories of the girls actually passing out and, and falling from the stage to their death during the can-can because of the restrictions from the corset um, and because they've even kicked themselves in their own heads and knocked themselves off so this this dance was quite risky in a lot of a lot of ways um so yeah I I, I feel like can-can is for athletes, I think dancers are athletes. We're, we're artists, but there is this athletic um, level to it. And if you ever want a good workout, like Can Can Dance Fit, it's it's a thing. <laughs> it's the way to go. <laughs> I definitely need to do one of them. I think, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And that's a lot of food for thought. It's um, really wonderful to contextualise the artworks in the physicality of what they're representing and how athletic and hard and difficult the lives of those women would have been to actually inhabit this world but also so wonderful to know that they're immortalized in some of the artworks that we have in our collection so thank you again Hannah for taking the time to speak to me today and I'll hopefully see you soon thank you very much yeah th thank you again to Hannah for that and um, so we have a few minutes and I think probably only time for one question so I'll get Rachel back on to answer this one hopefully and this question that we had, I'm just combining a few things that have come through in the chat. And it's touching on the conservation of the sketches, um, which people are asking if they were actually done in situ or if they were done from photos. And also people are wondering if anything, a testing has been done on the works to see if there's traces of absence or other substances that would have been present at the Moulin Rouge and consumed by Lautrec while he was doing them in them. Um, well, I, I can I, I can I can answer the the first question more more easily. Um, he did. I mean, he 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 did he did do some. I mean, some sketching from life, but also I mean, but also a lot a lot just done from memory. I mean, certainly that I mean that would have been the case with um with his his depictions of Marcel Lunder because as I said, he like she never actually came to the studio and posed for him. But I, I noticed um someone in the chat asked a question about um. The, the print of the jockeys, um, whether that was done from photographs or real life. And I think, I, I think that is a combination of real life photographs, memory, and also looking at Japanese prints. Yeah, great. And I guess um, in terms of the conservation and looking at the traces of materials that would um, have been in the spaces, it's quite interesting. And maybe we can recommend to our conservation team that they follow that up. <laughs> in the future to see what um, is still left on the surface of the artwork. So thank you very much, Rachel, for answering that question. And I'm really sorry that's actually all the time we have today. And it's probably my own fault for rambling on about Jane Avril for more time than I should have. Um, but this event has been recorded and it will be on the Courtauld YouTube channel very soon. And I only have time now to say thank you again to Bloomberg for their support and to our wonderful speakers this evening for taking the time to join us and everyone at home for also spending your evening with us. Um, it's been lovely and I hope you're all inspired. I am actually seeing Milan Rouge on Saturday, so I'm super excited about that. Um, stay in touch with us, remember to get your tickets to see these artworks in the gallery and also sign up for the next Open Portal Hour, which will be called Dress Up on the 16th of December and will actually align 
with what something that's just launched today, which is our after hours series in the gallery. And the first one of them will be on the 15th of December and the theme will be glow up. So check this all out online and I will see you all very soon. Thanks everyone and bye for now.